I'm entering something divine. I'm entering something that traveled through seven heavens. When Najmi the Hawa, Ma Ladna Sahibukum, Wama Hawa. Behina TV doesn't just teach you about the Quran. You can also learn Arabic from a brilliant teacher. Ustad Naman Ali Khan has made this beautiful ancient language easy to understand. So you're not only improving your language skills, but your understanding of the Quran too. Tap now to check out Behina TV. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wan-najmi idha hawa. ما ضل صاحبكم وما غوى وما ينطق عن الهوى إن هو إلا وحي يوحى علمه شديد القوى ذو مرة فاستوى رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد uh, Once again everyone السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته uh, I'd like to first start by thanking all of the people involved at EPIC uh, to make this program possible uh, I'm going to take uh, this few minutes in the beginning to give you an idea of what we're going to be doing inshallah and get right into the material because we don't have a lot of time contrary to what it might feel like so um, the concept, the idea behind this program, Quran Week, which actually I'm traveling with all over the world, and um, I plan on doing a different surah in every location, uh, is to actually help Muslims everywhere in the world begin to contemplate the Quran directly. We all know that we should be thinking about the Quran, contemplating the Quran, understanding it better. But for the most of us, we don't know what first steps we're supposed to take. How do you even do that? How do you begin to engage with the Quran? And for a lot of people, even though, of course, we all say the words Quran and Sunnah, Quran and Sunnah, Quran and Sunnah, for most of us, when we read the translation of the Quran, it kind of it leaves us in confusion. We skip over parts. We're like, ah, I don't get that part. Okay, let me go to this part. Let me go to this part. And so there's a lot of gaps in our understanding of what Allah is saying. And Part of the intent of this program is to bridge that gap and to help each one of you see, including myself, how beautiful and rich the word of Allah is, right? So what I'm going to do now in this 30-minute session, and by the way, just so you're clear about the schedule, I'm going to start at 7.30 every day. The Isha prayer here is at 8 o'clock. So I have that 30-minute window to get, at least get something out. And I need to take that opportunity. So even if you're coming in late or whatever, I'm going to start at 7.30. In fact, I'll be here probably 7 or before 7. So if you'd like to ask questions or anything like that, before 7 is fine. I'll already come prepared. So you're not going to mess up my preparation. Once I'm here, I'm at your service, inshallah. So 7.30 to 8, then we're going to pray Isha. And then 8.15, I'll be here right back again. We're going to have about a 45 to 50 minute session. If I'm really feeling like I want to you know, ruin your life, I'll have an hour-long session. After that, I'm going to give you a break. Uh, and then you can fight over chai and coffee, whatever they put back there. You have about five, seven minutes of a break, no more than that. And we'll have our final session. That's the idea. There are two goals we have this week. Uh, one, the primary objective, the main goal I have is to share with you tadabbur, and I'll explain what that means, on Surah Al-Najm, Surah number 53 of the Qur'an. So for those of you who didn't know, we're going to be diving as much as we can into Surah number what? 53, An-Najm, okay? And our second goal is going to be something Sheikh Suhaib Saeed and I call uh, lenses, five lenses to, to contemplate the Qur'an. What that means is, what are five things you guys should be thinking about when you want to begin to contemplate the Qur'an? Okay, so let's get right into the work. I'm going to tell you some things about what the dabbur means, what deep contemplation, what, what does that mean? Allah in the Quran did not say that thinking deeply about the Quran is a, an extracurricular activity. We know that some things in Islam are absolutely necessary, like the five, five prayers, there's no compromise on the five prayers. Some things are haram, they're absolutely haram, there's no compromise. 
Tadabbur of the Qur'an, contemplating, thinking deeply about the Qur'an, is actually something Allah demands in the Qur'an and complains when people don't do it. So it's not something light. It's not if you have time, you should do it. In fact, he says, أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ Quran Twice. He says, don't they then think deeply about the Qur'an? Twice he asked that question. Also, he says that he sent this book down for lots of reasons, right? So he says, he sent it as, as guidance. Everybody knows that answer. The Qur'an was sent as a guidance. Another place in the Qur'an, he says, أَنزَلْنَاهُ إِلَيْكَ مُبَارَكٌ لِيَدَّبَّرُوا آيَاتِهِ A book we sent down to you full of blessings for the goal that they should contemplate its ayat. They should think deeply about its ayat. So the fact that you and I have to think about the ayat of Allah deeply and engage in contemplation is actually one of the main goals of the Qur'an. Nowadays, the tragedy has become, and it's been there for a few centuries. So we didn't start this problem, but we're continuing the problem. And that is when somebody says, I'm, I'm learning Qur'an, or my child is learning Qur'an. You know what that means? They're memorizing Qur'an, or they're learning Tajweed, or they're learning how to, re- to sound the words. And we call that learning Qur'an. When the Qur'an came down, nobody called that learning Qur'an. Nobody called that learning Qur'an. When someone was learning Qur'an, they were pondering the Qur'an. They were thinking about the Qur'an. They were trying to understand the Qur'an. So now that I've said that brief introduction, now I want to make clear for all of you two concepts that usually get confusing for for us. Tafsir and tadabbur. I'm going to define these two terms for you. Tafsir and what? Tadabbur. Okay. Tafsir is basically, am I understanding the ayah correctly? What do the words mean? Do I know anything about when the ayah was given to the Prophet ﷺ? What is the context of the ayah? Is it being translated correctly? Is my understanding, the, 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 the lesson I'm supposed to get from this ayah, am I getting that correctly? That is tafsir. And tafsir work, our scholars have done centuries and centuries of work on tafsir. Sometimes they have debates in tafsir. We'll see that too. Sometimes there's debates. But for the most part, Tafsir is basically research-based. You have to do the research. What does this word mean? What does this ayah mean? What, what, how did the companions understand it? What was the story behind this ayah, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. All of that is the study of what? Tafsir. Okay? The mufassir, the people who wrote tafsir, they had a few basic questions in front of them. And when they answered those three, four, five questions, they moved to the next ayah. Then they asked the same three, four, five questions, then they moved to the next ayah. What does the ayah mean? When was it revealed? What, are, what, are, what, the, what did the early scholars or early companions say about this? Did the Prophet ﷺ say something about this, etc.? There's a few questions. Once they answer those questions, they move on to the next ayah. Okay? Now then there is, and by the way, in tafsir, if you, worked, if you went to a tafsir library, and soon you'll see on YouTube, Sheikh Suhaib and I have done a video series. We've recorded it. We're going to release it soon on a tafsir library, walking through a tafsir library. His library, actually, in Scotland. But anyway, if you went through a tafsir library, it would be like going to like the literature department in the library. You have different kinds of literature, right? And under each category, you got different books, but, but there's kind of similar genre. There are different kinds of tafsir, different specializations in tafsir. A tafsir bil ma'thur, tafsir al lughawi al adabi, al ishari. There's all different kinds of tafsir. And each one of them, there's multiple people who did lots of work in each one of those categories. So tafsir is a big world. It's a, it's a very big world. Okay? But at the end of it all, it's where scholars do their work to try to explain the lessons of the ayah in simple language to you. Okay? Now, that's tafsir. But there's one more thing. What was the other thing? Tadabbur. Oh, what in the world is tadabbur? Tadabbur is, okay, now I know what the ayah means. Now I know something about the, 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 the history of it or the placement of it and all of that stuff. I answered all the basic tafsir questions. What does it mean for me? What is this ayah they're doing for me? Like, what do I get from it? How, do I, how does it change my view of the world? In other words, there's the information and then there's the impact of that information. You understand? Tafsir will give you the information. Tadabbur is basically an exercise. How is this impacting my heart? How is it changing my view of the world? How is it supposed to change my emotions? How is it supposed to change my opinions? 
Because these ayat, they're talking about something that happened a long time ago, but they're also talking about my life right now. That's the dabur. That second part is the dabur. Now the problem that has happened in the ummah, and I say this, you don't have to agree with me, this is my own analysis. People that study tafsir feel like they don't need to do tadabbur. Tafsir is enough as tadabbur. We study the tafsir, that's good enough. And then people on the flip side came along and said, these people, all they do is read these tafsirs, but they don't really connect with their heart to what the Quran is saying. I want to read a translation and I want the Quran to talk to me about what it's saying to me. I'm going to do tadabbur myself, right? So now lots and lots of Muslims are reading translations of the Quran and trying to do what? Tadabbur. So the people of tafsir are not doing tadabbur and the people of tadabbur are not studying tafsir. And this is a disaster. <laughs> because if you don't have the correct basic meaning and then you start contemplating on top of that, you're going to be crazy. You're going to come up with crazy conclusions. But your heart tells you it works. This, by the way, down the road, this is what happened with a lot of denominations of Christianity. A lot of denominations. I, I, I was very fascinated with American Christianity because it has so many branches. And one of them, I'm, particularly, I was fascinated for a while with Joel Olstein. You guys know who Joel Olstein is? Okay, well, he's from Houston. He's a preacher, very famous, right? So um, I went to one of Joel Olstein's Christmas specials just to see what he does. I just want, I just want to experience the thing. And he took a passage from the Bible where there was uh, the Lord sent dew. Dew means like the morning misty moisture on the, on the leaves and things. That's called dew. He goes, and the Lord said, there shall be dew. So this year, you're going to have your dew. And then he starts doing everybody like, your, your job's going to work out this year because the Lord's going to give you dew. And, you're, and that divorce, oh, it's finally going to finish and you're not going to have to pay no lawyers no more. That's your due. And I was sitting in the crowd and all the people was like, mm-hmm, this is my year of due. You know, <laughs> this, was, this was like, everybody's buying into it. You know what he's doing? He's taking something from the Bible. He's coming up with this like fantastic thing and everybody's singing along. You know what that is? That's his version of tadabbur without any what? Any tafsir. Right? But on the flip side, whoa, Ibn Abbas anhu said this, Ibn Kathir said this, Qurtubi said this, Tabari said this, so you shut up. You know what that is? I'm going to quote everybody. I have all this information. Now there's no need for what? There's no need for tadabbur. My group, I'm, I'm part of a group of, of, of researchers, students of Quran. We, we study Quran together and we've developed a formula. We start with tafsir. We, we, we study the tafsir, and then we engage in what? Tadabbur. We engage in as much tadabbur as we can. And we ask ourselves hard, hard questions. And you're going to see a combination of tafsir and tadabbur in this series. In, 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 in what surah are we studying again? Remind me. Surah Al-Najm. Okay. Now, there are uh, the approach to the study of the Quran. That is a, a fusion between tafsir and tadabbur and some other elements. I have my own method for studying it. As you go through the study of the surah with me, you'll, you're going to see my method in practice. So instead of me talking in theory about my method, you'll kind of see it in practice and you'll see how everything comes together, inshallah ta'ala. But one thing I do want to tell you, I'll, I want to, because Surah Al-Najm is a Makki surah, right? So, it's a, it's, so we'll, we'll talk a little bit about Makki surahs. Uh, you know, in Juz Amma, most of the surahs, if not all of them are what? They're Makkiyah, they're Makki surahs, right? Now, if somebody asks you, what, are, what is the subject of Makki surahs? You'll say, oh, they talk about Allah. They talk about his signs and creation. They talk about previous nations that were destroyed. They talk about some stories of the prophets. They definitely talk about judgment day and heaven and hell. That's pretty much Makkan surahs, right? Makkan surahs have these five, six subjects, right? So if you open up Surah Al-Dukhan, it's going to be one of these. It's, if you open up Surah Al-Jathiyah, it's going to be a few of these. If you open up Surah Al-Qaf, it's going to be a few of these. If you open up Surah Al-Naba, it's going to be a few of these. It's the same five, six items, and they keep coming up. So then the question becomes, uh, they're kind of all the same. This one's about Judgment Day. What's this one about? Judgment Day. What's that one about? Let me tell you. Judgment Day. And you're like, 
they're all talking about the same thing. They keep, they keep repeating the same stuff. Oh, this one has Allah's creations. This one also has huh, Allah's creations. And this one also has, oh my God, Allah's creations. And if you just begin to read the Quran, especially the Makki surahs of the Quran, you'll start noticing there's a lot of repetition. There's a lot of what they call in English literature, redundancy over and over and over again, right? And so what happens with tafsir, here's the fun part, tafsir scholars, when they come upon an ayah, and they've already talked about an ayah similar to that one before, they say, Qad sabaqa dhikruhu. We've already talked about this. You can look it up in that surah. Right? Because it's not a new tafsir question. It's not a new question. The problem with this approach, this is not, it's not a wrong approach, but it's missing something. And I want to tell you what it's missing. The Quran, each surah is a perfect gift sent from Allah. Each one of them is a unique gift from Allah. No surah of the Quran is extra. Do you believe that? We believe that, all of us, right? No surah of the Quran is superfluous. We could do, we, we could, oh, I could have lived without surah an naba Taqweer was enough. No, that's not the case. Every single surah is part of the perfect divine gift from Allah. Nobody says, I have two hands. One of them is just extra. Nobody says that. We, in Allah's creation, we don't consider anything extra. We don't say the sun's good enough. The moon, I don't know. We don't do that. You know, one ocean was enough. I don't know why we need the rest of them. We don't do that. But you know what we do with surahs of the Quran sometimes? Ah, Makki surahs. We don't say it because we have respect for the Quran, but unfortunately, even Quran students, the Seer students are thinking it. They're thinking it. And that's a bigger problem. So what we're going to do, I'm, I'm going to explain this with an analogy and then we'll get started after. I got to keep track of time too, my goodness. Oh, I have 13 minutes. So good. I have good time. I want, I want to give you a simple analogy. You guys know what Legos are? Okay, Legos, Legos. Imagine I have like a bucket of Legos yellow, blue, different sizes, right? And I have five of these buckets, but they all have the same exact set of Legos, right? They all have the same five, six colors, all these different variations, all of them. And I give these Legos to five very creative kids. Are they going to create the same thing? No. The, the pieces are all the same. But when it was all put together, it was a completely, this one made a robot, this one made a dinosaur, this one, you know. Okay, you go to an architect. They're using brick, they're using wood, they're using metal, they're using sheetrock. But when they put it together, they're like, ah, brick, I've seen that before. No, you're like, that's an amazing building. Oh my God, that's incredible. You know, the way they use this window, the way they use that door. Oh my God, the way they use that angle. It's so incredible. Nobody comes and says, you know, that's just sheetrock, right? I have that in my house too. Nobody does that. Why? Because it's being used in a unique way, isn't it? In fact, our, the way Allah made us, our genetic sequence, essentially the, the, the fundamental components of our genome are the same. And it's just a rearrangement of that that makes us different human beings, doesn't it? At the end of the day. What I'm trying to say is, Every surah, even though it has components that other surahs have, has a unique signature, a unique fingerprint, a unique identity, a unique divine artistic expression, a unique beauty. And if you don't come to it with that attitude and you say, oh, it's just another Makki surah. Oh, it's saying the same thing again. Tadabbur is closed. Because tadabbur happens when someone comes to Allah's the majesty of Allah's speech, they come to it in awe. You know, people, I, when I travel, sometimes people want to take me to historical sites, right? When you go to like a historical castle or a presidential palace or whatever, at the door, people are taking selfies. They're like, whoa. They have this like awe. What I want you to have, what I want me to have, when I approach the doors, the entrance of a surah of the Quran, I want to be in awe. I want to be, I want to have reverence. I'm entering something divine. I'm entering something that traveled through seven heavens. I'm entering something that's, that's, that's more powerful, that travels fast through the 13.9 billion year universe. It, it traveled through the billion light year universe. It traveled across that and came to this man, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa and transformed the entire world. 
I need to have the right kind of attitude in my heart when I approach a surah. So you're not here. My point is, you're not here. And I'm not here to give you lots and lots of information, even though we'll go through a lot of information. The point of it is what some, something Allah says Himself. He says, أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ الْقُرْآنَ أَمْ عَلَىٰ قُلُوبٍ أَخْفَالُهَا Don't they contemplate deeply over the Qur'an? Or are their hearts something that have their own locks? Or some hearts have their own locks on them? What that means is, tafsir gives you ilm. But tadabbur unlocks the heart. Two different goals. Tafsir will expand your understanding. It'll give you concepts. It'll help you deepen your, rich, rich your, 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 your depth of knowledge. But then if tadabbur is missing, then the heart stays locked. Even you have a lot of knowledge. And that's why Allah gave the example of people that came before us who had a book and they had a lot, lot of knowledge of that book. But Allah says, فَقَسَتْ قُلُوبُهُمْ Their hearts became hard. You know, even though he, other places says, مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا عَقَلُهُ Even after they understood it. Because understanding, in our case, understanding the Qur'an is the tafsir question. But tadabbur is where the heart gets unlocked. You with me? So we're going to have to merge between those two. And part of that is, I have to approach the surah with humility. My own, part of my, I have my own Usulut tadabbur, like usulut tafsir is usulut tadabbur, right? My, my own usulut tadabbur are when I start the study of a surah, I assume I know nothing. I've been trying to study the Quran for 23 years now. When I studied, started re studying Surah Al Najm to prepare for this program three weeks ago, I assumed I've never read it before, I know nothing about it, and I'm going to just dive in. And I'm going to ask whatever questions come in my mind. And I'm going to document my questions and discuss and read and discuss and read and ask questions because I want to understand what Allah is saying to me above and beyond the tafsir. You with me? So that's the approach we're going to take. Now, I have, I'm going to keep track of time. Good, eight minutes. Eight minutes, I think I can do one, one good thing so we can move things along. So the, the surah uh, in the Quran is not like a chapter. Right, I've said that many times, but you, so because we're in this series, you guys need to hear that. Surahs are not like what? Chapters. Chapters depend on each other a lot. Right? So chapter 2, if you didn't read chapter 2, you're probably not going to understand chapter 3. And if you didn't read 1 through 5, you're going to ha have a hard time with 6. That's how chapters work. They're sequential. But the way the surahs of the Quran are, they are connected to each other, but each of them have a unique independent identity. They have an independence also. The word surah comes from sur in Arabic and saur, which is the ancient outside walls of a city. Those of you that have played Assassin's Creed might be able to visualize what the ancient outside walls of a city look like. That's what the word surah comes from. And inside of those ancient walls, there were all kinds of things going on. There were, there were markets, there were homes, there were, there were palaces, there were all kinds of things, right? So inside of a surah, Lots of different things are going on, right? But they all work together and create this ecosystem, right? So the same way inside of a surah, you might find multiple subjects. You're not going to find Surah Al-Baqarah only talking about beef and cows from the beginning to the end. Even though it's called Surah Al-Baqarah, it's going to talk about a lot of things, right? Because it's inside the bounds of this. So we're entering now into this world of Surah Al-Najm. My demand from you is live in this world for a week. All of you have questions about Islam. I have a question. Can you comment on mortgages? I have a question. Hey, what about nail polish? I have a question. Can, can I eat In-N-Out Burger? Is that halal? I have a question. Oh my God. Put your questions in a shelf and lock that shelf for a week. Just put it away. Not because I'll be annoyed by your question. Not because of that. But because this week, the only questions on your mind should be the ones that come to you from the reading of Surah Al-Najm. Don't just surrender your time here. Surrender your heart and your mind to the word of Allah for a week. Wonder, ask, document your questions. Think about what he's saying. I wonder if that's what he's saying. I wonder what he means by this. I don't understand this. Start engaging the surah you're, like you're really, Allah is speaking to you directly and you're really trying to understand what he's saying to you personally. Not, hey, what did you say? What did you say? What, did you, what do you think? What do you think? 
for yourself. That's my process for myself. In fact, I do that before I even study tafsir. I read a surah, I read, I read if I'm studying surah al-Najm, I'll read it 50, 60 times to myself over and over again. And then I'll start writing my questions and writing my thoughts on the surah. Even if they're crazy, I'll write everything down. And then I'll start talking to my team. Hey, I had a crazy thought. Is that crazy? And they'll say, yeah, that's crazy. And here's why it's crazy. And I had another crazy thought. You know what? You're not the only one who had that thought. Imam Razi had that thought too. I was like, oh, somebody eight centuries ago, nine centuries ago thought what I was thinking. That's pretty awesome. High five to Imam Razi. And then, you know, so that, that's my process. And I want you to be part of that process this week. That's what you're going to get out of this week. I want you to leave this week, inshallah, and myself with a new relationship with the Quran. A relationship based on the appreciation of tafsir, but more importantly, the icing on that cake, the dabur itself. Because the goal of the Quran one of its goals, fundamental goals, is the double. Now, in order to understand a surah, I believe every surah has a design. You can call it a structure, you can call it architecture, or you can call it a design. Every surah has a unique design. Remember I told you those Lego pieces, you put it together, you get a different design, or the architects does a different design? The same way, Surah Al-Najm has a unique design. And I'm a student of, I, and this is one of my areas of interest, to understand the structure and the design of a surah so I can, un, I can contemplate it better. So what I'm going to do before the break is give you a picture of what is the design of Surah Al-Najm. What's going on inside Surah Al-Najm, okay? The first, and, and because there's so much going on, I'm using titles, but the titles are not doing justice. Just know that. I've broken it up into five titles, five parts, but the, those parts are not going to do it justice. Once we get inside the part, you'll see a lot more, okay? So here's the first part. Allah is going to talk about the event. Essentially, He's going to talk about the event of the final revelation. He's going to talk about the Prophet meeting Jibreel alayhi salam, the beginning of the final revelation, and the two great meetings the Prophet ﷺ had with Jibreel alayhi salam, once in this world and once in the heavens in the Mi'raj, in the ascent. He'll talk about those two great meetings. And that's the event of the final revelation. We'll dig deeper into that a little bit later. Then he's going to talk about, interestingly, he's going to switch. By the way, meeting with Jibreel, what kind of creation is Jibreel? An angel. And Allah will say, by the way, you people deny that he met Jibreel. Let's talk about what you believe about angels. And so they believe that the angels will speak on their behalf on Judgment Day, that they are daughters of Allah, and, they, and we're going to dig into that. And that's their false idea of salvation. That's what I mean by false salvation. Then Allah will talk about, makes sense, no, that's not how salvation works. True salvation works this way, right? And you don't need angels to come in between and plead your case. Allah is forgiving on His own. Allah forgives sins on His own. Inna rabbaka wasi'ul maghfirah will come as a response to this false idea. Then. The next topic is going to be, Allah will talk about revelations throughout history and guidance that has been throughout history and how unfortunately so many nations received guidance and rejected guidance and received guidance and rejected guidance. So a summary of all of previous revelation, summary of its main lessons, and a summary of the tragedy of history when people, when na different nations dealt with revelation. And finally, the final day is just about arrived. Azifat al-Azifah. The, the final day is on the verge. We're in the final episode of the, the, the story of humanity. It's begun because the final revelation came. That means the last episode for human history has begun. Azifat al-Azifa. Now, if you look at these five components, you'll see the final revelation and the final day are at the beginning and the end. You see that? There's a, there's a relationship between the top and the bottom. Does everybody see that? Right? And then the, the false salvation, the, their wrong beliefs, are contrasted with the right beliefs that have been sent throughout history and all the nations that had false beliefs and therefore got destroyed. And right in the middle of it is the truth about what is going to happen on Judgment Day. And how are we supposed to have a relationship with Allah? So in a thematic sense, the surah actually has a kind of a symmetry. It, it all, everything converges. And so we're going to go through one section of this at a time. The time for salah has started. I'm going to take a break. I'll see you guys back at 8.15. Barakallahu li wa lakum. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Explaining the Qur'an in depth as part of the Deeper Look series. Studying the Qur'an in depth can seem like a really intimidating thing that's only meant for scholars. Our job at Bayyana is to make 
deeper study of the Quran accessible and easy for all of you. So take us up on that challenge. Join us for this study, the deeper look of the Quran for this surah and many other surahs on BayinaTV.com under the deeper look section.